In a recent video I walked around the outside of Porchester Castle. Today we're going to go back and take a little look inside. The Outer Bailey, this large open area inside the perimeter wall, you can visit for free. It's a popular spot for picnics. The Inner Bailey and Keep you have to pay to enter and that's where we're going now. The castle was originally a 3rd century Roman fort and has been modified and rebuilt and added to across the intervening centuries. It's quite common for old castles to get refortified and reused like that. The inner bailey that we're walking around here is the ruins of a complex of palaces and halls built under Richard II in 1396. But we're heading inside the keep, which is of Norman construction, dating from 1130, so just before lunch. The keep has been restored somewhat internally, so there are a number of wooden floors interconnected by staircases, creating several large halls under a lead roof, which we'll see in just a moment. To continue going upward to the roof from the uppermost timber floor, we have to ascend via this spiral stone staircase, which is a little bit uneven and difficult to use, so mind your step. Up on the roof we've got a fantastic view of the whole castle complex as well as the surrounding areas. The city of Portsmouth is over there across the water, and then Gosport over there. And from up here on the roof we've got an excellent view of Peewit Island, which I walked to at low tide in a recent video. The tide is in during this visit so you can see it as an island. From the other side of the rooftop you can see across Paul's Grove and Porchester. And down on this side, the Roman ditch is not exactly a moat, as it's only flooded at high tide. And it doesn't completely encircle the curtain wall. I'm not sure if it once did. Back down the spiral staircase, which is even more tricky than going up, and we'll follow this staircase all the way down to ground level. See, it goes out to that hole. Oh, right. 
Plus, we're not even halfway down yet. On the ground floor, there's the reconstruction of a small theatre that was used by French prisoners of war who were imprisoned here in the early 1800s. Prisoners would put on performances for the locals, apparently. Heading back out into the inner bailey, we'll take a look at the ruins of Richard II's palace. And then Ashton's Tower, which was the home of a constable of that name in the 14th century. And that's more or less it for this little visit. There's a lot more to see at Porchester Castle than I've shown here, including a small museum of archaeological finds, as well as St Mary's Church and various other bits of ancient architecture. But I figured it's best not to spoil it by showing you everything. Right, well, we're here out in the New Forest looking for oyster mushrooms, but um, it's been so, so dry this summer that all of the fallen beach really has almost nothing on it. However, we have just spotted a little clump of chicken of the woods over here, which actually looks like it might be in quite good condition. Yeah, I would say that looks reasonable condition. Still nice and firm. I think that might be worth picking a bit of. There's older specimens down there. I'll have a look around the other side of this. This is an old chestnut tree. I will have a look around the other side because there might be some others. So before I actually pick any of that, I'm going to have a little scout around and see if there are other specimens that perhaps better suit what I would like to put, pick today. But not seeing anything. Yeah, nothing that I can really see, but we, we will have a bit of that one that we saw. Eva's getting agitated because I've walked away from her. So yeah, we'll have a bit of that one in there, definitely. And I think I will probably try dehydrating it. Yeah, it looks pretty good. We'll have a few bits of this and we'll take it home and try drying it. As I say, it's growing on a chestnut tree. I'll tell you how I know it's a chestnut tree in just a moment. I think I'll probably leave it there. I'm not going to pick any more than that. So yeah, it's a chestnut tree and I was able to recognise it as a chestnut tree because in some places there are remnants of bark, which is quite coarse like an oak, 
but also if you look at the trunk here you can see that the grain has got a kind of spiral aspect to it so that's very characteristic of chestnut and it's split longitudinally like this as well which again is very characteristic of chestnut timber as it ages so that's how i know this is chestnut not that it really matters all that much except that some people say you shouldn't pick this fungus from a yew tree because it might be toxic it might have absorbed some of the toxins from the tree this is definitely not a yew tree so remnants there of much older specimens and i think around here there's something else it might not be i thought i saw around here dryad saddle but it might just be a very old chicken of the woods yeah it's just an old specimen of chicken of the woods So there's another one here, this is a slightly more recently fallen chestnut, I think it's chestnut, might be oak, yeah no that's oak. But chicken of the woods is sometimes found on this as well, so we'll have a little look around. It's a kind of fungus that you might find, but if you find it you will often find other trees infected or in, inoculated with it elsewhere in the same locality. So. We'll have a look around. There's a beech tree over here. We'll see what's on that, if anything. This is a really quite old bit of forest here. So some of these big beech trees in ancient times, you can see there's a fork of the tree there. These were these were pollarded, these trees. So it's a bit like coppicing, where you cut the tree down repeatedly and then harvest poles. But for out in the forest here, they used to do it above ground level and it's called pollarding when you do that. So you cut the tree off above ground level and it regrows poles, except this tree has been, somebody stopped pollarding this tree maybe a hundred years ago and now it's just grown full-size branches from that cut point up there and unfortunately with, with beech trees they get really heavy and brittle and then this tree you know sometime in the next decade or two maybe tomorrow this tree will just suddenly fall apart got a uh, species of ganoderma there i think it's an artist fungus kind of bracket fungus not edible Right, well, I don't see anything on this beech tree. I think it's not been here long enough to start actually breaking down and growing fungi on it. Right, onward. Oh, hello. Look at that. So another old chestnut tree with lots and lots of chicken of the woods on it. Some of it's going to be a little bit too far gone to harvest, but a lot of it won't be. Very nice. But you can again tell this is a chestnut tree because look, if I stand back, See how the wood grain has got a spiral to it. How about that though? That was worth a visit. Quite a lot of bug stuff on here, so I'm going to be a bit judicious about which piece I pick. I'm going to go around the other side and have a look, see what's around there. Just another very large clump here. Perhaps a little bit far gone for picking. But I'm sure some of this is okay. Because tucked away in various little places, there are younger fruiting bodies. And this is the size that I ate before, and it has very much the texture of chicken when it's that size but the flavour starts to tail off a little bit. Right, camera away for a moment. Right, well I've got some bits there. I think they might be a little bit too mature to just cook, but I'm going to cut them into strips and dry them. And I think that when they're rehydrated, they'll be even that much more meaty. So, bye-bye chicken of the woods. So this fallen tree here is an oak, and so we can see the difference. See, it's got furrowed bark so it's quite similar to chestnut but it hasn't got that spiral in the grain of the wood it hasn't got that kind of spiral growth pattern there is nestled into that beech tree there a big specimen of Ganoderma artist fungus let me get you a bit closer 
not an edible fungus but always interesting to see so here's a beech tree where you can see a much clearer evidence of ancient pollarding see it's got a single trunk up to just above head height and then it's multiple trunks up from there now that can of course happen naturally but there are a lot of trees a lot of old beech trees in this wood that are exactly like that and that is because they've been pollarded rather than coppiced now coppicing is a way of treating a piece of woodland as a timber sort of harvesting resource so you cut down all the trees they re-sprout they grow poles you get to harvest some poles to make fences and baskets and so on out here in the forest if you coppiced you'd find that the new shoots would very likely get eaten off by deer and cattle and horses and so on that are roaming wild here or roaming free so pollarding was a way of avoiding that you let the tree grow to above head height and cut it off there and let it re-sprout from that point and the new growth is too high up for the browsing animals to chew off the young shoots and that's why they used to do that so yeah this is an ancient pollarded tree and yeah hasn't been actually maintained for probably a hundred years and obviously now it's too late so at some point this tree will just self-destruct because those big branches that are kind of offset will tend to just shatter and fall off. Here's something that's always a little bit of fun to find when I'm out and about in the woods. This is a piece of oak timber that's been infected by a fungus called green elf cup or green wood cup. Another bit there and another bit there. And it gets stained by the fungus, this really unnatural looking sort of coppery blue green colour, this verdigris sort of colour, but it's completely natural. It's a fungus that just does that. And uh, people used to collect the timber. People used to cut the green stained timber from this fungus. And they used to make it into a veneer that was then pressed into blocks and cut and used, I think it was used in something called Tunbridge Ware, if you want to Google that. So green elf cup makes the oak branches turn deep green like this. So in case you think I was just making that all up about pollarding, you can see that actually all of the younger beech trees, anything younger than a few hundred years old, just a single stem like that. So all of the younger beech trees, presumably the ones that came along after the pollarding stopped, are single stems. It's only the really, really old trees that have this multiple crown. Well, look what I found over here. Now this is a a beech tree with chicken of the woods on it so this is what I mean about it being locally abundant so you can find it if you find one specimen of it it's worth looking around now it's actually an oak tree so we've got an oak tree and a beech tree that are growing so close together they're kind of hugging each other isn't that cute and the fungus is growing on the oak tree, I think, exclusively, not on the beech. The oak tree doesn't look in very good condition, actually. There's a lot of dead wood up there. Don't know whether that's because of the fungus parasitising it, or whether it's just been kind of swallowed up and starved of nutrients by the beech tree. But look at that, so there's a beech tree and it's grown almost to, around the oak tree it's almost like they fused together there isn't that interesting now I don't know how compatible they are in terms of grafting together but almost like the branch of the beech tree has grown into the oak I wonder if it's stealing nutrients from it How interesting. I mean, I've seen trees growing together before. If they're the same species, so if you get uh, beech trees doing this, they tend to just fuse together. But this is two different species. I just noticed there are branches further up doing that as well. So where the beech has grown into the oak timber. So yeah, I don't know if it's actually almost parasitizing the oak or whether it's just physically bonding to it or physically merging 
I don't know whether there's any actual tissue merge there that's maybe stealing nutrients. I mean, beech trees are not conventionally thought of as a parasitic plant, so, but you know, this is a strange situation. So this is interesting, and I shan't get too close. I don't think these are the kind of bees that sting, but what we've got here is lots of little solitary bees. You can see all of their little burrows in the soil there. I'm not a threat to them, so I'm not very worried about them stinging. I don't think actually this species of bee does sting, but I'm not going to take any chances. It's like a little bee city, how about that? Despite the rain we've had, there's not really any water in this little stream. This should be a little trickling stream. It usually is when we come here, but the drought has just turned it into a few muddy puddles. I imagine the muddy puddles are probably teeming with whatever fish have still survived. Well, not bad. We didn't actually get what I came here for, which was oyster mushrooms, but we've got chicken of the woods. So let's get this back to Atomic Shrimp HQ and see what we can do with it. Chicken of the woods, we've got kind of two forms. We've got the younger, more spongy, and the older, slightly tougher. I don't think either of these are ideal for eating. This is a little bit on the young and soft side. And yeah, in my experience, this is just a bit like eating tofu. Nothing wrong with tofu, but it's not like chicken. And this one, although it will probably have the texture of chicken, is probably a little bit sour tasting, perhaps a little bit dry and maybe a tad unpleasant. I'm just going to be wiping these with a damp cloth to get the surface dirt off them. They're in very good condition, but like many wild mushrooms, they don't take very well to washing. They're called polypores for a reason. Underneath here is a sponge-like array of pores that the spores come out of. and if I was to wash that, that would fill up with water. You'd almost be able to wring it out. With the younger one, I think it's going to be a case of slicing it into pieces. And so we can see what the inside texture looks like there. And you can see it's kind of a bit wobbly. This one, I don't know whether we'll slice it or whether we'll tear it. Yeah, this is where you can see the kind of chicken-like texture. See, it comes apart in strands, very much like chicken breast. And when it's cooked, the illusion of chicken meat is actually pretty convincing. So that's all of the more mature specimens cut up into thinnish strips. We'll see how that dries. It's interesting, it does actually smell kind of like chicken soup. And this is the younger, more fresh specimen. And the texture of this is really strange. It's almost like fish or something. I'm going to put that on the dehydrator for nine hours at 40 degrees Celsius and we'll come back and have a look and see how it's done. So after the initial period of drying, let's see what we've got here. So these are the kind of softer, younger specimens and they're still quite rubbery and they feel a bit moist. These are the older, more mature specimens. They kind of feel a bit like balsa wood or art foam or something. These are quite dry. They were drier to start with than those anyway, but both of these need another session in the dehydrator. And what I tend to do here is give it a blast of drying first, leave it for several hours at least, and then another burst. And the reason for leaving it in between is you get a thing called case hardening, where the material you're drying forms like a crust on the outside and that can inhibit further drying. So the inside might still be quite moist and the outside is a kind of dry crust. And if you put things away in that state, you might think they're dry and then the moisture equalizes and then it goes off. So allowing it a little rest in between two periods of dehydration allows the moisture to come to the surface, allows the pores and the material to open up again and lets that moisture out of the inside. And actually the second drying session is often very much more effective than the first. Those have had the extra four and a bit hours. Um, they're still warm, they've only just turned off. But let's have a look and see what we've got now. So these are now very light and they feel quite brittle, yeah. So that's completely dry. So that's the more mature 
bits. The younger bits are kind of a bit leathery. So what I'm going to do with these is I'll leave them all to dry out and air out and then we'll just assess whether they have lost all of their moisture. We might just cut one or two of them in half and just have a test inside to see if it feels moist. They still feel quite flexible but I think that just might be the way they are. I have three lots of dried mushrooms here. That's the more mature specimens which have dried really well. They've dried to well, a texture that's almost like very brittle wood. I've got the, this is the younger specimens and these are the bits that went crispy. And then some of the pieces I perhaps didn't quite cut so thin are still a little bit bendy and squashy feeling. Those will probably not preserve well. So those I won't store. We might, if we're going to cook something with this soon, we might use these pieces first. So what can I do with this preserved chicken of the woods mushroom? Well, my thought is that because this is normally quite a tasteless mushroom, I can rehydrate it with some tasty vegetable stock and try and get some flavor into it. So that's the plan. And we're gonna try and make something a bit like a chicken pie, but obviously with no real chicken in it. And just to see what they would come out like, I've rehydrated two pieces of this stuff. So that's the younger kind, that's the older one. The older one is still quite firm, but it definitely does have a texture like cooked chicken. Look at that. Okay. The younger one, it's rehydrated okay, but it's quite rubbery and it's more like a rehydrated dried mushroom, which is obviously exactly what it is. But this is the one that's come out with the more meaty sort of texture. So that's the one we're gonna use in the, in the pie. I'm gonna make a kind of chicken and mushroom pie or chicken and mushroom style pie, but obviously I'm not gonna to have to add mushrooms because the chicken is the mushrooms. Just for kind of consistency, we're gonna keep the whole recipe vegan or plant-based. So I've got this stock powder. We'll have a couple of teaspoons of that. These are my homegrown dried herbs. I'll have about a teaspoon full. And whenever I make a chicken gravy, I always add just a tiny little bit of this curry sauce. I always think that the kind of savory notes and spices you get in this curry sauce are a little bit chickeny. So we won't have much, just a little pinch like that. I'm just gonna to add to that about a cup of water. And now some pieces of my chicken of the woods dried. So I'm making two small individual pies. So I think it's probably not gonna need much more than that. That was about a handful, I suppose. So just make sure that those are nicely immersed in the stock and I'm going to leave them to rehydrate in that stock for at least an hour. So this stuff now looks a bit like and smells quite a bit like chicken. And I've got a shallot which I'll just chop up into nice small pieces. So a little bit of oil in a pan. We'll just fry off that shallot for a moment. And now the pieces of chicken of the woods mushroom which I have wrung out so they're not too wet. And I will save that stock because that'll be useful for making gravy and if this needs any more moisture I can add a little bit from there. Just let that reduce down to almost nothing. And then I've got another ingredient to go in there. Some old dick from Southwark Brewery and I'll give that the same treatment. I will just simmer that until it's reduced and soaked in. As that completes its reduction I'm just gonna turn the heat off now, I think, and let that just continue to evaporate and soak in. So here I've just got some of this Nuge cashew paste with hot water and give it a little whisk to combine. That's gonna be my substitute for milk in my cream sauce. Vegan white sauce, which is just gonna be some vegetable-based spread, about the same amount by volume of plain flour. And we'll just give that a little sizzle until the flour is cooked. And then straight in, with this cashew based milk substitute. Now that was hot, so this is gonna thicken fast. But that's okay, the whisk will prevent lumps. A little bit of salt. Okay, and we've got a creamy white sauce, which will continue to thicken a little bit, so I'll turn the heat down. So yeah, nice creamy white sauce there. Let's give that a taste. A Little bit of pepper, 
a little bit of nutmeg. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear my grandson in the background making noises. And a tiny little bit of this stock just to loosen it up. Okay, another little taste. Yeah, that's really good. So this chicken of the woods, fake meat, can come out now. Not gonna waste those bits of shallot, I'll scrape them out into the sauce. So let's just have a little taste of this chicken of the woods. Now it's been cooked in stock and beer. That is really good. Mm. Okay. So I'm gonna dice it now. That looks good. And that can now go into the sauce together with the scrapings of shallot. And again, a little taste just to see how it's all coming together. Right, it's time for a little bit of brutal honesty about this chicken pie filling, this fake chicken pie filling. It looks just like the kind of filling I might expect in a chicken and mushroom pie. It's a creamy sauce with chunks of what looks like chicken in there. It looks the part. It smells the part. It smells quite mushroomy actually, but it does smell like it's got chicken in it. But there's a problem. Well, the texture, it kind of looks like chicken, doesn't it? See, it comes apart like chicken there into little threads and fibers. That does look like it's cooked chicken, but there is a problem with the texture for eating. It's just a bit dry and woolly. And I think that's because this mushroom was a little bit overdeveloped for picking. So it has the texture of chicken, kind of like the texture of chicken crossed with cotton wool. Definitely tastes like it's got chicken in it, but it's just zero succulents. It's just fibrous and dry. So I'm not gonna waste time making a pastry case to put that in because I don't think that's really quite an edible pie filling. Well, I mean, it's edible, but it's just not enjoyable. You can see why this stuff is called chicken of the woods though, because look at that. It really does look like chicken, but I think you've got to get there at exactly the right moment to pick it. If it's too young, it's kind of rubbery and bouncy and stretchy and just like rubber. If it's too old, it goes very fibrous like chicken, but it also loses all of its succulents. And that's the case regardless of whether it's dried or cooked fresh. Actually, when I picked this, when I picked this down the road, it was a little bit of a mature specimen. And again, it was quite dry and fibrous. It was much more chicken-like then because I think that specimen grew a lot faster than these did because we got a drought this year. I'm not gonna throw away either of these dried mushroom things because even though this is not edible as it is, it's got a fantastic mushroom flavor and it'll make good stock if I just pull the pieces out and throw them away after soaking. And this stuff is not like chicken. It's like really kind of resilient tofu or something like that. So this one we'll find a use for somewhere else. So a bit of a disappointment, I realize, but we did not quite succeed in making a convincing chicken substitute with this chicken of the woods this time. Maybe I'll be lucky and find it just on that cusp between rubbery and fibrous some other time. It's time for the comment positivity section where I'm gonna pick out half a dozen comments or so that either asked interesting questions or made me smile or said something insightful or perhaps just made me happy in some way. So reading glasses on, here we go. <clears throat> I don't know who needs to know this, but my cat really likes watching these videos, <laughs> okay? Well, I'm not a cat person myself, but uh, I'm happy that it makes your cat happy. Atomic Shrimp, you are everything that's right with the internet in what can be a cesspit of awful. That's a really kind thing to say, thank you. Um, someone replied to that actually saying, maybe YouTube needs a wholesome button we can click to make all of the noise go away and make room for nice things humans have to offer each other. That's a good idea actually. I mean, YouTube kids is a bit of a disaster, but maybe there needs to be a YouTube wholesome or something. Hmm, good idea. Hey Mike, you never do give up, do you? You just plod on and find a solution. I've been watching your videos for a long time. That's one thing I've learned about you. Also, Mike, you've still got those sardine tins to repurpose. That's true. I still, actually, eel tins. This is just a very small selection of my collection of eel tins. This is from Chinese braised eel. Now, I have made a few things out of these tins. I've made little clamshell boxes that were quite useful for carrying spices around for camping or traveling. Uh, but I've got a whole load more of these tins. And they're just very nice tins. They're very nicely painted, decorated, and they're useful rectangular tins. So I have in mind to maybe make like a drawer system where these push into and can be used for nuts and bolts and knickknacks. So that's a plan. 
I've got dozens of these and I just need to make something that they fit into. One day I might get around to doing that. Oh, this was on a slow TV episode. I've now watched this three times, a video on plants. I'm an anxious person, but I feel so calm. Mike, what have you done to me? I'm really pleased to see that. Actually, not everybody gets slow TV, and that's fine. Not everybody has to. The slow TV episodes I put out are really just unnarrated footage of natural things or something that can just be on in the background or can be kind of almost like video wallpaper. And I just put these videos out because... Some people find them really calming. Some people who maybe don't have access to nature or can't get outdoors still find it calming and relaxing to watch slow TV of bees on flowers or a stroll around the woods or water bubbling over rocks. There's nothing exciting about the slow TV episodes, but that's kind of the point. They are just there for people to enjoy as background noise or just as a reminder of our connection with nature. So not everybody likes slow TV. I do, and I'm glad some others do too. This is an interesting one, actually. This is on the episode about stained glass, making a stained glass lantern out of sea glass. This reminds me of a documentary I once saw about a company making custom wood flooring out of really irregular boards from crooked trees. They scanned every board they had in stock, and an AI filled a given living space with the scanned boards in a way that they would align with each other with only minimal offcuts. They would then fetch the boards from storage, cut a couple of edges off, install the parquet, and it was a very smart way to use trees that didn't grow as intended. And I think the final look was absolutely stunning. I've never seen it anywhere again. That sounds really interesting. I really like that idea. It's a very interesting application of technology to make an end product that sounds like it would be unique and interesting in its own right. I can't find anything about this, so if anybody's got links to where, where I can watch this documentary about somebody making flooring out of irregular trees using technology. I really like the whole idea and I would love to watch that. Uh, again on the slow TV, at 2.17 I swear I heard something singing the Bee Gees. In hindsight I think it was just the chives talking. I <laughs> the no need to apologise. I do love a dad joke. And finally, in a way, you remind me of Jack Hargreaves. A bit of interesting history of the places you go and some hands-on demonstrating of picking stuff and making things out of what you collect. I learn stuff without realising it. Peace. That's possibly the kindest compliment you could possibly pay me. I have very fond memories of watching Jack Hargreaves out of town after school or at the weekends well, on rainy days when I was a child. And I grew up watching Jack Hargreaves. If anyone watching this doesn't know who Jack Hargreaves was... I will put some links in the video description that explain who he was and some links to some of his broadcasting which is viewable online. Jack Hargreaves was a man who explained aspects of the countryside or village life or sort of rural stuff, sometimes some strange little carpentry tool or piece of pottery or something like that. And he would make documentaries about things he found interesting and present them in a way that was incredibly engaging. And he's kind of a childhood hero of mine, actually. I think something may have rubbed off. And they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I am not consciously trying to imitate Jack Hargreaves, but I think something about the way he was interested in almost everything he saw must have rubbed off on me as a child because I do find myself revisiting some of the things that he did. Maybe I might even, at some point, visit some of the places where I've seen him walking and maybe just do a kind of revisit of of what's changed since the time when he made those films. But yeah, it's very, very flattering to be compared to Jack Hargreaves in any way and it's a, just a huge compliment. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. My friend Louis invited us to join him spotting some of the hairs of Hampshire on this art trail. This one is called Wavy Hair. These are sculptures of hairs that have each been decorated by different artists and placed in the cities of Southampton and here Winchester to encourage people to explore the cities more. Each of the hairs has a different design or theme. This one is called a wild walk on the downs. There are also a number of leverets, small hairs, which are installed inside various businesses and other buildings. Harder to spot, although there is an app to help find them and collect the sightings. Up next to the West Gate, here's Hero Hair.
Um, so that's the Great Hall. Now we'll head on up to the Great Hall, which houses King Arthur's Round Table. Not the actual one, for various reasons. The Round Table in the Great Hall is a 12th or 13th century work of mythic art. We'll go and visit that another time. In the forecourt of the Great Hall, here's Lepus, or is that Lepus, Roman hair. And I can see a few more leverets through the windows here. Just down the way, this one's called Caring for the Natural World. Up near the archives, here's Pierre, the Hampshire Hare. Back down by the City Museum, we can see a lot of the bollards here are painted with different designs. This is part of a similar sort of art event that happened back in 2005. Here we also find H.R. Hare. Near the cathedral, there's one named Flora and the Midnight Garden. It's kind of Laura Ashley, that one, isn't it? Laura Ashley? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Be on a plate. Laura and the Midnight Garden. Oh, wow. I you, yeah. And then behind the cathedral, this one's called Polly. My favourite so far. Outside the Guildhall, shine bright through the dark. And Doodle Hair, I think actually my new favourite. Taking a walk down the River Itchen, we encounter a hare appropriately named Chalkstream River Itchen. It might be that it branches there and goes off to something else. And then be your beautiful self.
Hartley hair. Sort of scary, this one. And then back past the cathedral to look for one more. Now you might be wondering what's the point of all this, but I will say it was fun to track them all down, and it made me go to places in the city that I might never have seen otherwise. And when the exhibition's finished, the hairs will be auctioned off to raise funds for a children's hospital charity, so it's good fun in a good cause. So here's the last of the hairs for today, 24 karat hair. Links in the video description if you want to find out more about the hairs of Hampshire. I've come out for a little wander down this strip of recently cultivated land. This is where I picked the goose foot and nettles for my recent budget video. I just wanted to kind of correct a couple of misconceptions that I think maybe people have got about me. And the first one is people thinking that I'm some kind of expert. I do get a lot of people saying, oh, how do you know all the plants? Well, the reality is I don't. I know some of the plants and typically the plants that you see me talking about in a video are the ones I do know. So it might well come across on the video as if I know all of the plants. Reality, I know some of the plants very well. I know the ones in particular, the ones I like to pick to eat. So we are surrounded here by goosefoot. And interestingly, I don't know which species of goosefoot this is, but I do know they're all edible. So I know that plant really well, well enough to pick it confidently for the table. There are other plants here which I do not know quite so well and what I thought we'd do is maybe use the app to identify some of them because there's something to say about that as well but going back to the whole expert thing uh, yeah I'm not an expert I know how to use reference books I know how to look things up and some of the plants that I know about I did look up years and years ago and so I know those very well but others, you might see me identifying them in a video, and that might be only the first or second time I've actually seen them. Often you'll hear me say that I'll label it in the video, and so I look it up when I get back home. Anyway, let's have a look. So this one down here, well, all I can really tell you about that one is it's a nightshade, because it's got these little flowers that are very much like potato flowers. And so that is going to be a nightshade of some sort. Probably we'll have poisonous berries. But I think what we'll do, we'll get the app fired up and we'll have a look and see if we can identify it. So there we go. Seek has identified that as black nightshade and I think that's probably correct. Right next to it here, I think this is Bistort, but not absolutely sure. So let's have a look and see what this what Seek says this about it, so it knows it's spotted lady's thumb. There we go. So, not Bistort, but again, I'm familiar with seeing this plant, but I've never picked it. I don't even know if that's edible. I have a feeling it might be edible. I think it's related to uh, buckwheat, but not, not very sure. So, more information about that one coming on the screen in just a moment. So, here's one I do know. That's fennel. So probably a garden escape. This plant is found wild in this country by the coast, but here we're a little bit further away from the coast. It's most likely a garden escape from one of these houses here or something like that. But yeah, that's fennel. Kind of makes me wish I was doing one of these budget challenges with foraging because that's a edible herb. Right, here's another little plant I don't know very well. Four petals, so I'm guessing 
that this is going to be cabbage family of some sort, or mustard family. Let's have a look and see what the app says. Well, rather comfortingly, Seek also struggled to identify that one as well. Some kind of cress or something, I would say. But again, I'll take some pictures, I'll get the book out when I get home, and we'll see if we can actually identify what that one is conclusively. More fennel there. So I think probably the other thing to address then is my stance regarding apps for identification of plants. I think some people thought maybe I had a bit of a downer on the whole concept of using apps to identify plants. That was definitely not the conclusion I came to from the video I made where I tested them. In fact, the conclusion was they're great, they're just not suitable for the purpose of identifying things you intend to eat if you can't confirm the identification independently. That was really the only negative connotation I had about the apps, was that you can't use them to tell you whether something is safe to eat or not, because the small, the small possibility of false positives is just too risky. Anyway, let's go and find some other plants. So here's an interesting little plant that I spotted the other day while I was out walking the dog. And here's one I'm not very familiar with. So it's just got these little tufts of yellow flowers. The flowers are actually very small, really hard to tell what those might be. They could be pea flowers, they might not be. They're a bit small to be able to tell. I don't think this is native, maybe it is, I don't know. It's not a plant I'm very familiar with. So let's see what the app can do with that. So Seek eventually came up with the identification of yellow sweet clover for this, which I think is about right. It looks more like something in the pea family than it does like in the mustard family, which it initially tried. Now, I think that was just on the basis of colour. From a distance, that is the colour of mustard flowers. But it's not the shape of mustard flowers. Mustard flowers would have four little petals. These definitely don't have four little symmetric petals. So, yellow sweet clover, I think. So yeah, I think it's very important just to address those two things. One, I'm not an expert. If anything, what I know most about is what I don't know. Um, that's not false modesty, that's actually just a statement about sometimes knowing that you don't know things, or knowing that there's a lot you don't know, can help to protect you against making false assumptions. And the other is, I've got nothing against these apps. They're, they're great. They get people out, they get people looking at plants. My only reservation about them is that I just don't recommend them to be used as the sole source of identification for something that you can't otherwise identify that you intend to eat. Now some people have said, yeah, but what about in a survival situation? In a survival situation, maybe the app could save your life. Um, I don't think so. In fact, I think it's more likely the app would lead you to harm. If you're in a survival situation, you're stuck in the wilderness with a smartphone that can run an app that requires an internet connection, the best thing to do is close the app, phone for rescue. And this is the last plant that I want to try to identify using the app today. So the flowers kind of remind me of rose family, but could also be daisy family. So really don't know. Let's see what the app says. So the app took us pretty quickly to an ID of shaggy soldier for that one. So, never heard of it. So that's something to look up when I get home and I'll put that on the screen right now. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.